Welcome everyone to the policy committee meeting for August 29th, 2023. Um, welcome everyone. We'll start with the roll call of the committee members first. Um, Mr. Lex. Present. Mr. Bernalbrian. Present. Ms. Loman. Present. Um, Mr. Schultz. Present. Ms. Robert. Present. Ms. Henry. Present. And I can't see any other board members if they're on the line. Okay. No. I don't see it. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from May 23rd, 2023. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Motion carried. Um, we're going to start our meeting with old business. I wanted to let everyone know that there's a slight modification in the agenda in terms of the sequence of time. So, in light of the town hall meeting last night and um, community members that are here this evening, we're going to move policy 218.2 regarding weapons and other dangerous items up to item 10 on the agenda. So it will be under new business, but it will be after the policy in AR 830.1. Uh, we've got to get some other policies reviewed and adopted. Not adopted, but so please review and discuss. Um, but we want to that policy Okay. We're going to start with old business, starting with policy AR 10 use of medication. Yes. So, um, items three, four, and five on the agenda, the items that were listed for old business. They've actually been through this committee twice before. Uh, they were inadvertently left off of the board agenda uh, for August. So we're going to resend them through two rounds of board readings so that they get two consecutive board readings. The plan was not to discuss each of these items tonight since they've already been discussed twice. The board's already approved them once, but if there are any questions, uh, we could certainly take questions. Okay, any questions from the board regarding policy in AR 210, policy in AR 122, or policy 123? And policy 210 is use the medication, policy in AR 122, is that is and co coaching activities, and policy 123 is um, Any more questions? Okay. Mr. Giazzi, I just have one question as it relates to policy one, two, three regarding students, student athletics. And I know we have language in the policy that addresses um, gender expansive and tra our transgender policy. But I'm just curious in terms of kind of preemption analysis, if we have a PIAA rule. Um, that is contrary to our gender expansion, expansive and transgender policy, and or non compliant with the law. Um, how would we resolve that from a preemption perspective? So the law would govern uh, any type of law would take precedence over uh, PIAA regulations or board policy. If there was a conflict between PIAA regulations and board policy, uh, if the sport that we were talking about was a PIAA sport, uh, we would have to abide by the PIAA rules in order to participate. Uh, but if it was a non PIAA sport, the board's policy would remain the rules and regulations that would be in effect. Um, thank you. Um, any other board questions regarding those three policies. Any questions from the community regarding those three policies and those three presentations? Okay, seeing that. We're going to go to new business, starting with policy 827, conflict of interest. I'm going to turn it over to the audio. Yes, so policy 827 was a policy that was revised not too long ago. And as a result of 
uh, the state monitoring, we were asked to add a sentence uh, to the conflict of interest section of this policy, of the reporting conflicts of interest section. Just a statement that if there is a conflict of interest in um, the federal programs, that we report that to the federal programs agency. It's a very, very minor change to the policy just to comply with the recommendation from the uh, PDE monitoring uh, group. Any um, board questions regarding policy on 827? Um, Mr. Yasser, just one um, quick concern. Under reporting conflicts of interest, we have um, reporting any perceived conflict of interest, but we don't use the word perceived in other portions of the policy. So for purposes of consistency, um, I think you need to add that um, to uh, the first, maybe second paragraph under standards of conduct. And then the delegation of responsibility. So to avoid any real comma procedure of parent conflicts of interest. Okay, we can we can make those changes. Okay. No problem. And is the language in the improper influence, the very first paragraph? which seems to govern um, actions of individuals outside of the board. Um, is that just for purposes of notice to the community with respect to any, any contributions to a board member or candidate for the board that would um, have a purpose of influencing them? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I scroll down, but it says internet connections in the state. Because the second paragraph really is germane to the board's act, the board member's action. And so I just question did we need that first paragraph at all? Under improper influence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because that we may not be able to. Um, control, well, would we be able to evaluate whether the donation or contribution is made for purposes of influence? influence and I Our screen is stuck here. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ignoring you at all. Oh. I'm taking notes to make sure that if we uh, don't get back up and running here, that I can follow up. Um, not a problem. Oh, we will. I, I will take a look at that first okay. paragraph. And I think, you know, if you need me to send you any email with respect to that change, I'd like to do that too. Yeah. Say what I do have a question. Yes. Um, under the disciplinary actions, that seems focused on staff and faculty within the district what happens or is there any language in here that i'm not seeing around if the if a member of the board is found to have violated this policy what are the consequences and it, it can um it can cause repercussions with the district's ability to receive the grant funding are there any repercussions that we could put in place that, i mean or not. Like as a board, our policy would be that a board member would have to step down or something along those lines, or is that not in the realm of authority? <clears throat> not within the authority of the board okay. to take that type of disciplinary action okay. against another board member. Thank you. Okay, any other board questions regarding policy H27? Any questions from the community regarding policy? Okay, so we posted as a first group of our next legislative meeting. 
Um, next, moving on to policy and AR 800 records management. Yes, so policy and AR 800 is the district's records retention policy. Um, the policy was last looked at in 2018, and it appears that when the policy was adopted back in 2018, we, we never completed uh, the administrative regulation, which was the actual retention chart. So the retention chart is much older than 2018. Uh, Mr. Swiger brought to uh, our attention earlier this year that uh, we should look at updating our records retention schedule uh, so that the district could continue uh, managing records in accordance with a schedule, which is something that we need to, which is something we need to do. So the, the schedule uh, that you're seeing attached to the administrative regulation is an updated retention chart with various timelines, which are compliant with the various legal timelines that apply to certain documents. So certain records you have to retain for different amounts of time. That, that records retention schedule is up to date currently with applicable law. Um, any more comments regarding policy and AR interpretations? Um, maybe I'm not reading it correctly, I, that could be definitely the case, is that the 800 ARI attachment A, the records retention schedule, um, the, the heading student records, there doesn't appear to be anything underneath it. So the student records, it, does it refer, there should be a reference to another policy? It's complete. It's what? It's blank. It's blank. Yeah. So what we'll do is um, there's a separate policy that we have in the 200 series that relates to student records. Okay. And we treat, uh, as as you know, Ms. Loman, uh, certain special education records need to be maintained for a certain period of time. All of that is spelled out in the student uh, records policy. So there should be a cross-reference yeah, there. Yeah, now it's it's on page six of nine of the... Okay, six of nine. Any other board questions regarding policy and AR? It's a mag very minor. Um, once this is moving to passage, could we make sure that that attachment is in a PDF format rather than a dot doc? Yes, that's all right. Thank you. Mr. Piazza, I just wanted to make sure that I was looking at some of the time frames, retention time frames correctly in appendix A. Um, some of them have 30 years. Is it yeah, there are some some records that are required to be retained for 30 years. There's all sorts of there's all sorts of footnotes in there and, and uh, all of the laws are linked there. But yeah, there are there are several categories of records that have to be held on to. Quite some time. And then, just with respect to the legal hold on um, procedures. Yep. Um, again, it, it seems like if there's a matter that required that was maybe related to impending litigation, a staff member could determine that that was the case. But the determination regarding whether a legal hold could be imposed is really between the superintendent and the solicitor. Correct? Correct. So, and many times what triggers the litigation hold is uh, whenever we're on notice of a potential claim for any any reason, uh, we generally notify our insurance carrier. And that notification to the insurance carrier is generally a signal that we have to implement the litigation hold. We get a claim number and then we work with the superintendent's office and generally the business office. Um, to put our carrier on notice and to preserve any documents that need to be preserved. Can we then clarify in the first paragraph of that section that when a matter is likely to lead to litigation by or against the district, the superintendent of designee and consultation with the solicitor will determine whether legal hold will be um, placed in the record? Yep. 
just reiterates language that's already <clears throat> later on in that section, but I think it clarifies more precisely the process. Any other, Mr. Shell? Thank you. I, uh, under responsibility, there's there's a series of points around the nature of the retention, reasonably accessible, um, and in a secure manner. I wanted to just raise the question of uh, backups, or basically making sure that we're retaining these records in a way where they're safe from from being either uh, corrupted through a cybersecurity attack or you know, simply a hard drive failure. So. For consideration, if yeah. that doesn't feel in the scope, that's fine. Any other board questions or comments regarding um, policy in the RE Any questions from the community? Could you state your name? Your Hi, I'm Gail Chase, um, an alum community yeah. member. Are you talking about student files that are located underneath the principal's office in the cage from 100 years ago? So, Admittedly, one of the purposes of bringing this retention schedule forward is because there are a lot of records that are housed currently in the district that can be discarded, but we didn't have an updated retention schedule. And so now that the retention schedule is updated, or will be updated, we will then uh, be tasking staff with going through those records and getting rid of the ones that we shouldn't have. We, we recognize there are records uh, in, in the in, alumni in many, in many places. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 they're absolutely not. I've never gone through them. They're phenomenal. Right? <laughs> Their box is dated 1903. Right. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, there was a requirement to hold certain records for 99 years. Most of those, that, that requirement has been rescinded in the last 10 to 15 years or something like that. And so many, many schools like Cheltenham have records that go back a, an awful long time. Oh, totally cool for an archivist. <laughs> for an archivist, it, it's phenomenal. And you should take a trip down to the cage mm -hmm. underneath. It's next to the front room because it, it would just blow your mind the, the history that's there. Well, there's an appendix that you actually have mine, say, all like all categories of records that we might maintain, and then gives a period of retention oh, and the ability to destroy them after that retention period is Maybe it's just an empty box sitting on our shelf. <laughs> <laughs> but just it, it, every time we go in there for yearbooks and trophies, um, it's a wonderful feeling to see the history. Not what's inside them, but <laughs> something's in there, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Any other community questions regarding this policy you may ask? I saw Mr. Schultz that you had a question. I was pondering just the, um, insofar as there are old public records that might be of historic interest, is there a mechanism? I, I doubt it would have to appear in this policy, but I'm just curious is there a mechanism by which interested historic societies in John Lamb or, or archivists? My Reggie team. Jackson's is gone, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but the public, I know the student records wouldn't be public in, in the first place, but if there are public records, would we be able to get them to somebody interested um, or not? That uh, we we hold we, stuff that's actually interesting. We um, could. I, I don't know what exists. Um, there was a couple years ago an effort to start to um, was actually when we needed to free up some space in this building. The records there are not in the best of condition. Okay. So um, I think we'll we'll know the answer to that question once we start going through them and figuring out what condition they're in. But but sure, there's something that's of of importance or relevant. I can imagine an interesting BBL project 
Next on the agenda is policy in AR 830, security and personal information slash each notification. So policy uh, item number eight and item number nine on the agenda could probably go together. Uh, policy in AR 830, security of personal information slash breach notification and policy 830.1. Uh, data governance, uh, storage and security. These are both new policies. There were revisions to the uh, Pennsylvania Data Breach Notification Act uh, that went into effect earlier this year. And these two policies are policies that uh, PSBA has recommended. Uh, my office reviewed them and uh, we are recommending bringing them forward. Uh, there are additional policies that we have to have in place uh, they just talk about the processes to, uh, processes that are in place with uh, managing records with sensitive information and the steps that we would take in the event that there was some sort of breach. Okay, any board questions on policy number eight? And this does comply with the breach notification. Correct. Yeah. That's right. As amended uh, most recently. Yeah. Correct. Um, any board comments with respect to Policy and AR on 830 or 830.4. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know which one this would apply to. Um, I noticed that, I guess, particularly the breach notification policy seems primarily reactive. So, in the event of a breach, here's what must happen. Um, is there a policy that talks about cybersecurity and what we need to be doing to keep ourselves from having a breach in the first place. It, it, does that exist? I don't know that that exists in policy. Um, and so it occurs to me it might be appropriate to, it's, it's a project, it's not something we would brainstorm in this meeting, sure. but it might be appropriate to think about what best practices we would like to put into policy uh, in our district to prevent. So there is some language in 830.1, the AR as it relates to data confidence system and security. I'm going to do the training. That's um, great. The AR. It doesn't talk about the AR. And when tabletop exercise is, um, you know, really doing some education around cybersecurity. And on top of it, because there's, Actually, you know, is this policy. operational security where, yes, we want to teach our, our staff not to give away their password or fault for phishing attacks, but there's also technologies that can be incorporated that augment those security. So password management systems being utilized in the district or if, again, I don't, I'm not gonna go anywhere any deeper, but I could, there could be room for more of us. There's some general language, Mr. Schultz in 830.1. I think what you're talking about might be more, uh, I think what you're going to see in 830.1 is high level language right. and you're you're thinking more operationally and we can we can we can look at that i've made a note to thanks yeah. follow up on yeah. that yeah that one also be more a security plan mm -hmm. um internal operational not necessarily policy because there's right. language in 830.1 that does talk about <laughs> excuse me um you know multi-factor authentication um, other things that we do on a proactive basis to make sure that we don't have And I, I would state that uh, if the board so desired, we could give an update on what the precautionary measures are that we are taking because a lot of what you mentioned, we are actually doing. Right. I figure, I figure it's plenty. Thank you. I'd be interested, but only if it's easy to do. This is Mr. Uh, just a, a general question, and I'm not going to pretend to be a, a security expert in, in the matter, but just um, I, I recognize that the the verbiage around 
personal information that do not include that's like publicly available. So I would expect that that include the person's address because it doesn't exist here. And get that for an adult. I'm curious about if there's a, if there's something we should be considering to differentiate as it applies to a child's address. Um, I know as a as an adult, I fill out forms for myself. I I do all kinds of things. Um, and I might do that on behalf of my child, but I'm not sure that I would want the district's records that has my child's address on it to be um, you know, not privy to the personal information piece. Like I get it. Um, I know I'm doing it. I'm the person, I'm the adult doing it, which is entirely, I just, I think just, uh, just don't know if there's any consideration in that space or if there is, if that's something that, you know, some line that could be drawn, um, cause look, the, the, the child is not knowingly putting their address out there as an adult. I know I'm accepting that responsibility, but, um, I just did security or just the personal information, uh, let me stop myself from playing one, but just, um, quite frankly, just, I get the adult's address. Um, I'm not so sure I, I wouldn't want the child's address to be treated as personal information, although public in some way. And this policy is not intended to be a policy about what information the district will disclose. So we have a separate policy that complies with FERPA that says we don't release information in student education records or anything like that. This just means these two policies are designed. If there's a breach, you know, if someone were to hack our system, what are the legal obligations depending on the records that they accessed in that breach? Oh, but to your point, like the district doesn't have a practice of disclosing student information absent an, uh, an educational reason to do that. Okay. Did that, did that answer your question? It, it, it does it just to, to tease it out a little bit. So just, I think the definition of personal information as stated is likely something that's very common. I would expect in that language probably exists some somewhere outside of this policy. And so I'm just in a way, just challenging what flexibility we have. If in fact, this bottom statement about personal information does not include public available information, which I would expect in it is a person's address. If there is some way to delineate, if in fact it's a, a, a child in that case, like I just, yep. I think it's more personal when it is a child in this case, given the district's responsibilities um, to kind of protect that information, as you mentioned, in the, the other references to policies that we have. So just like insofar as the, we have something here that says that it's personal information, I know that we referenced that in multiple ways, but just challenging what that actually means and if we can define it a little more specifically when it comes to um, information that is public, like as an adult, right? But like as a child, like, I don't, I, I'm not doing a great job at framing it. I don't Mr. think. Jackson, I, could you cross reference Trumpman? Because well, under the law, personal information is that included there under the statute. And, and what might and help is the definition of personal information for these two policies comes right from the data breach. The data breach act. Right. That said, FERPA has a different definition about what constitutes um, personally identifiable information in student records. Um, I think I understand what you're saying, Mr. Brudelowitz. Let me let me reflect on that and see if there's a way to make that clarification. You know, I, I do I, I do think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and I can you know I'm talking about yeah exactly yep. first uh, the first policy meeting I might be a little rusty. <laughs> 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 And this is actually what I did in my own job. That's right, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to turn over it. I'm not going <laughs> to. Um, any other board comments regarding policy and AR on 830 or 830? 
Any community comments or questions? Yeah, just a very humorous comment directed to you, sir. In my desk at my home is a directory. I have to spell it. My parents' names, our names, my brother and sister's names, our dates of birth, yes. our addresses, and our phone numbers. We didn't have cell phone numbers, we have email addresses. I still have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I needed to look up a classmate who lived on Mulberry Lane, I have all their information. I remember this is a records retention policy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in mid condition because all the local community businesses would put their advertising. Yeah, of course. Wow. I'm going to bring it to my next one. <laughs> 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 I have a question. Sure. Tara, I'm not with mm -hmm. I don't know if you touched on policy 819 FD here, but I'm not seeing it online. Is this a policy distracted or is this something that's already in place for the person? I know it's not 830, but I'm, just, I'm seeing it on the screen. So 819 was a policy that was uh, discussed a year or two ago. In the draft section, we see old policies that was merged with a different. With a different policy. Okay. So, just just for uh, student health, uh, student health information is treated um, the same way as other personally identifiable student information in our student records policy. Okay. Um, it doesn't because we are a school entity. FERPA controls as opposed to HIPAA. So that policy that you were seeing is more of a HIPAA-based policy. We're not subject to the HIPAA requirements because we're separate. We're, we're subject to the separate FERPA requirements with respect to any type of health information. So that would be generally like school nurse records, medication logs, things like that. They're all protected and they're, they're confidential under FERPA. Oh, because my question was regarding HIPAA. Um, specifically for sports related incidents. Um, so we're governed under FERPA, not HIPAA, when it comes to communicating health information. Correct. If a student at least injured and who was communicated to. Correct. Because that's been a question that I've been concerned about, but I'm not sure. So my background is healthcare. So it's big Correct. in my, my job. So Correct. I'm like, I'm always curious to be following the law. We are not a cover. I've we are seen not a fraction according to the laws, but if I know we don't follow the laws, we are not a covered them. entity. Okay, correct. That answers my question. Yep. Okay, thank you. And thank thank you for the question. Just for the community, I know I'm very versed in the FERPA, etc. cetera, um, so my, but probably for the general community, we use a lot of that thing. So, this we have to include Sure, FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. FERPA is health insurance for the only accountability. I paused because I was saying it in my head before I said it. Out loud. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> um, any other community questions or comments? Okay. There's no hands raised. We're good. Is there any hands raised? Oh, we're good. Thank you. Okay, then that will also go back. Um, he goes to the first street at the left. Correct. Thank you. Um, as I stated in the beginning of the meeting, we moved policy 218.2 regarding weapons and other dangerous items up in the agenda. And now that's the next item on the agenda. So, um, share again. Okay. And just as a note, earlier today, Dr. Scriven also shared with the community some additional related policies, two of which we will not be discussing this evening, but one is to make for the record our related policies regarding weapons. That's policy 356 and policy 904 regarding public attention and school facilities. But this evening we're going to be discussing 218.2. Two, two. Yes, so uh, policy 218.2 is the policy that applies to students. And it's the weapons and dangerous items policy 
it's very much uh, consistent with state law. So the definition of weapon is a, is a definition that comes from state law. If you read under the guidelines, there's been some questions. I know a lot of individuals in the community have asked, what is the discipline uh, or the consequence for bringing a weapon to school? As a general matter, uh, school boards have broad authority to implement codes of conduct and consequences for different infractions. There are only a, a few, uh, weapons may in fact be the only one where state law actually dictates a consequence when an offense happens. So state law actually states that if a student is determined to have brought a weapon onto school property, they shall be expelled for a period of not less than one year. Uh, the board in consultation with the uh, superintendent or, or actually the superintendent in consultation with the board uh, could seek an expulsion for a longer period of time than one year, but the, but the law states not less than one year with the caveat that uh, the law does give the superintendent some flexibility to recommend a shorter expulsion for uh, miti you know, mitigating circumstances. As to what constitutes a mitigating circumstance, uh, it's essentially up to, left to the determination of the superintendent based on the circumstances of the incident. Uh, weapons on school property, are a reportable offense under the Pennsylvania Safe Schools Act. So anytime a student would be found with a weapon on school property, that incident would have to get noted on our Safe Schools report. That gets submitted annually to the Department of Education's Office of Safe Schools. And we reference uh, a couple other policies in this policy, one being policy 233, which is our suspension and expulsion policy, discipline for violation of 218.2 um, is in accordance with, we follow the process outlined in 233. So students get due process uh, before they're simply expelled. They, get, they have a right to an informal hearing. If the student's a special education student, they also have uh, the opportunity to have what's called a manifestation determination. That determination seeks to uh, determine whether the root cause of the behavior stemmed from a student's uh, disability or not. And then students, if they are uh, recommended for expulsion, they're entitled to, if they opt for one, they're entitled for a hearing before the board. Um, or what frequently happens, the board designates a hearing officer to hear that case and prepare a set of facts and uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law that the board would then act upon. So all of that, I say all of that just to give some context for the discussion uh, and so that you know which aspects of this policy are required by law and which aspects, you know, there's a little bit more discretion. Um, thank you very much for providing that context on the TV out there. Any board questions regarding uh, policy 218.2? Ms. Um, I have a question about the, in the definition of weapon. Um, it says that the term shall also include lookalike weapons, replicas, models, and facsimiles of weapons. Um, I don't know, it's been a while since I've looked at Act 26, which is the <coughs> state law on which this policy is based. Um, but I don't think replicas or lookalikes were, is, it, is in the language of Act 26. That, that may be correct. That, that may be one piece um, uh, that is not required by, by law. The, the, other, the other items are certainly called out in the law. I can pull that up. Okay, thank you. I, the same with dangerous <coughs> item. I, I know. I know for a fact that that's not included in Act 26, that's an addition. All right, so the definition of weapon uh, includes, but is not limited to a knife, a cutting instrument, a cutting tool, uh, a nunchuck stick, firearm, shotgun, rifle, and any other tool, instrument, or implement capable of inflicting serious bodily injury. In many school districts include 
lookalikes and replicas in the definition of uh, weapons because of the disturbance and the fear that they can cause in the school environment. Um, and sometimes that would be uh, a factor that the superintendent would uh, consider in terms of the length of expulsion that would be recommended. So a I guess what I'm just trying to ask is a student could still be disciplined by a school for bringing a lookalike facsimile model sword, whatever you want to say, to school, but it's not required by Act 26 that they be so disciplined. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the board has the authority to um, have reasonable rules and regulations about the behavior of students in schools. But for purposes of, of the definition of weapon, uh, that's defined by state law. But, but we're not limited by the definition of state law as to objects that we can tell students are not permitted in the school environment. Um, no, I mean, besides that and the inclusion of dangerous item, this is pretty much verbatim from what the, from the state law, I mean, this is sort of, it's there because it has to be there. And, what it is what it is so my main reason for really wanting to bring this to the table um was because there were concerns around um, our transparency with sharing with the public as a whole what our policies were with respect to weapons um so this was the one step of honoring that request uh, to bring it to the table in a public session so that we could have that dialogue, which we are having right now. Um, I guess my question, uh, Mr. Diazio, is there or did we attach uh, an AR for 218.2? I so, know there's one for 218. Yeah, so, so with 218.2 and then also uh, policy 356, which is the weapons policy for staff, and 904, which is uh, the policy that states that uh, at school events, no one is allowed to possess weapons. We don't necessarily have administrative regulations because the policy is fairly absolute, right? No weapons. Right. So uh, the board in the past has determined that there hasn't really been a need, and the administration has determined there's not really a need for regulations because it's a pretty absolute rule. You can't have them. And if you do, we follow the law in terms of uh, how we respond. It would be different, for example, um, if weapons were permitted under some circumstances, but not under others. The regulation might outline when is it appropriate to have a weapon, when is it not appropriate to have a weapon. But in this case, since the rule is fairly absolute, no weapons, uh, there's not really a need for an administrative regulation. I think if I were making any recommendations to the committee, I don't know that we need the term dangerous item in this policy. And I actually think it, it, it would be an enhancement to this policy if we merge the definition of weapon and dangerous item, not necessarily to call out all of those other those other things like smoke bombs and stink bombs, but to, to, to leave the definition uh, consistent with what's in the state law. You'll note that this policy has a last revised date of August of 2017. Believe it or not, this is actually one of the oldest policies on the books. Um, you know, we, we are looking at an average age of the policies of three years. So 2017 is one of the oldest ones. So it wouldn't be the worst thing uh, to clean this policy up a little bit, uh, make the definition section just contain a definition for weapons, and uh, maybe modify the title instead of it being called the weapons and dangerous items policy, just have it be called the weapons policy, which is consistent with what we did in the staff section of the policy manual. And would it also uh, be acceptable to define why there is no AR to this policy, um, just so that's noted? And the reason I asked the question was more for the public, uh, because I really want to educate our public around 
this topic, and I want to be as explicit uh, as I can with how we are governing um, ourselves as a district with respect to this topic. Sure. So um, that, that's my main reason for wanting to elevate this and the other two that will be forthcoming. Can I just pose a procedural question? Um, in the absence of I'm not having an AR, and I can understand the why. I don't have that. <laughs> some of the recommendations that were made last night that are already, some of which are already in place by the administration as it relates to sporting events, like, you know, doing the walking, book bags or no book bags at events, et cetera. My understanding is that that would be part of it, not a policy, not an AR, but a um, a um, procedure that would be documented, but not necessarily incorporated into the policy of the Just wanted to clarify. Right. right. That's 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 correct. I was just gonna if we it's at so two eighteen regards students, three fifty six regards that so nine oh four is not a weapons policy for the public it's about. So I guess I Maybe if we're looking at those other ones to see clarification, some there because that policy talks about a lot of other things and it only mentions I think weapons once and it's kind of not buried but it's in a long list of other things. So sure. maybe making that or at least look at it so that it, there's some continuity. Um, I'm just gonna. I we have to have we have to have this. 218.2. We have to have it. It's a state law. Act 26 is a state law. We have to have Act 26 because we wanted to get money under the Gun Free Schools Act. Um, I am going to make a, a bit of an argument for why you might want an AR. Um, <laughs> having been on the other side of Act 26, representing children who were facing a year or more of expulsion for bringing a, a weapon to school, everyone likes this law until it happens to their child until their child is the one who makes the poor decision to bring a weapon to school, or not even realizing they're bringing a weapon to school. I represented kids, very young children, and this is why the a, where the AR comes in, very young children who brought pocket knives to school, who were expelled for a year, um, or who were going to be expelled for a year until we got involved. Um, so the AR might wanna set out some factors to consider when discretion might be used to recommend a punishment either more or less than um, the one year requirement. Um, and I just throw that out there because there are, I represent them, there are many circumstances under which kids bring weapons to school. I cannot tell you how many kids are represented who had box cutters in their backpacks because they worked at the dollar store. Um, so, there's there's a lot of circumstances under which we a weapon can be brought to school, some with complete malicious and evil intent, and some with not not even realizing that it's in their bag. Um, so it's it's a whole it's a spectrum, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And there's you know loaded guns, and then there's two inch pocket knives, and those are all weapons. And so there's and there's a spectrum of of what is you know, possible too. So I just put that out there as a consideration maybe for having an AR to set out some of the just factors to consider when recommending either more than a year or less than a year in terms of, um, you know, thought. To tease that out a little bit, you're not, you're not saying that you should not include those as weapons because under the law. No, no, you can't. They're weapons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you can't. That, the definition is extremely broad. Which is, I guess, what I'm saying that because the definition is extremely broad, like the consideration of when there's some mitigating circumstances becomes that much more important, I think, because there's so many things that can be considered a weapon under this, a pencil. Mm -hmm. So if I could talk a little bit, uh, and Mrs. Loman, you tell me at the end if maybe I addressed your question. So I pulled up the, this is the secondary discipline chart. This is the uh, this is uh, part of Administrative Regulation 218. We cross-reference 218 in the weapons policy, and the intention is that the imposition of any discipline is consistent with this chart. 
Um, years ago, back in 2017, I, I feel like Dr. Smith and I spent the summer working on these discipline policies. There were many different policies that talked all about the consequences for discipline. And we wanted to bring them together in one document, one for elementary, one for secondary, to standardize the, the way in which discipline is administered. Obviously, the administration and the board also wanted to be very deliberate that you wanted the administration of discipline to be consistent with your equity policy. So uh, looking at this chart for secondary, uh, we start out by saying that the administration of all discipline should be consistent with our equity policy. We then list a number of restorative practices that are available for all categories of offenses. You'll see in a minute when we go down, uh, restorative practices is a, um, a potential response to almost every infraction. We also included language here that the severity of any consequences will be proportionate to the severity of the infraction, the age of the student, current and prior disciplinary record, special circumstances about the incident, whether the student was the aggressor or the victim, and any other circumstances that are relevant. If we, if we scroll down here, um, we have academic infractions, we have property infractions, uh, infractions against others, Health, safety, and welfare infractions is probably where we'll see. So for weapons and other dangerous offenses, we list expected conduct. So maintaining a safe and orderly school environment. Violations of that rule would be violations of policy 218.2, which would be bringing a, a weapon onto school property. The next and last two categories on the right are the first offense responses and the second uh, offense res responses. We include restorative practices, uh, parental contact, referral for possible uh, expulsion. We have to list expulsion there because of yeah, the language yeah. and the law. We could potentially modify this chart um, or more explicitly spell out in 218.2 that any discipline should be consistent with this chart, which is intended to incorporate all of the principles of equity and uh, discipline imposed on an individual basis based on the circumstances and not based on like a matrix, so to speak. I, I just wanted to add in practice what that looks like um, is Whenever there's a situation with the weapon, principals um, and building administrators have been directed to um, contact myself or Mr. White to share that information to make sure that we are being equitable and that all of the um, ways that we handle it based on age and based on the various circumstances that we're consistent. So that if a fourth grader at one of our schools has this incident and it's identical at Winco, those two administrators may not know but myself and our security director would know um, how those situations were handled to make sure that they stay consistent and that all of our families see a consistent application of um, that matrix. But, but on a practical level, though, if that child, because of the incident itself, has to refer to law enforcement, that could trump whatever we would have thought about in mitigated circumstances as it relates to this Absolutely. And that's why Mr. White is involved because he has a direct connection to law enforcement and he gets that information directly as well. I think if we wanted to think about more direction, just in the interest of keeping everything in one place, I might suggest to the board thinking about the chart, modifying the chart if needed as opposed to an AR attached to 218.2, but I want to make sure the, the full committee is comfortable with that. I don't think we need to modify the chart. Mm -hmm. It needs to be referenced. Yeah, I think it just needs to be referenced. Mm -hmm. okay. As soon as you brought that up, I was like, oh, oh right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that, that may, yeah, I think maybe just referencing the existence of the two charts. Okay, we can make that. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, I, I, well, I, I, sort of. I, I have a clarifying question.
question. Can I just yes, absolutely. Mr. Piazzi, I just want to make sure that you've been able to take the notes on Yes, okay. yes. I just have a clarifying question <laughs> about the state mandated verbiage. So is my understanding correct that it's mandating expulsion for a period not less than one year, but also allowing for a period of less than one year. Right. But is the key here that the super, I mean, the, look at the wording, if a weapon is determined, it has to escalate to the superintendent. And the superintendent is the only person who can determine where on that chart. Correct. So it should fall. Correct. Okay. So that, thank you. That, Oh, so I'm not then I'm not clear because the guidelines as it's written. Okay, so if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, you said under the law that you would have to expel a child for no less than a year if they brought a weapon to school as defined under the statute. With the one caveat that the superintendent may recommend a shorter period. Okay. Um, on a case-by-case you know, case basis in accordance with correct. correct. So the default is a year. Yeah. When an incident with a weapon takes place, that automatically would get referred up to the superintendent mm -hmm. for other infractions. Um, like, let's say students were two students were involved in a physical altercation. The building principal would initially handle the discipline. If the building principal determines that through restorative practices or other discipline short of expulsion is warranted and nothing more, they resolve that at the building level. It doesn't necessarily get to the superintendent's desk, but with weapons, it's the superintendent that is the individual that makes the determination as to uh, whether a lesser term of expulsion would be imposed. And not always, but almost always, the times when discipline is imposed short of one year would be those examples that Mrs. Long gave. You know, clearly uh, a, someone brought something in their book bag that was unintentional or something that was not intended to harm that may have been there for a legitimate reason over the weekend or something like that. Um, those are usually the, the instances where that comes up. Any other board questions? Um, yep, just one. I remember us talking about this when 356 was revised. I brought it up because I just the uh, um, in the, the definition of weapon in 356, um, it does have the caveat that the term does not include any item approved by the superintendent or designee for possession in conjunction with a lawful supervised activity or course. So I could I, I see that playing out as that adult permitting a child to use this. Like I don't see a what an adult would do um, unless it was just unless we're talking like exclusively for law enforcement, um, like supervised activity or course. But the reason why I said it is because that language doesn't exist for a student. The, it, is it is it there? Yeah. It's very. Oh, it's just written a little bit differently. Not <laughs> the definition of weapon. Interesting. I remember the conversation. I think we, we talked about reenactments, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember the conversation. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, disregard my question. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the board? I can't see that far, so. <laughs> no one online. We do that. We do have an a virtual attendee. So okay. with their hands. I'm going to allow them okay. to speak. I'm going to go to the folks first here in the room, and then I'll go to the virtual attendees. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone in the community have a question or concern about 218.2? Okay, and we'll go to the virtual community. Okay. 
Ms. Rockwell-Jackson. Ms. Rockwell-Jackson? Uh, yes. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so first, thank you for bringing the um, the policy forward and for the discussion. Um, I have a question to uh, Ms. Lohman's point around accidentally bringing sort of um, knives or box cutters or uh, maybe smaller or less harmful weapons uh, to school accidentally. Um, I can see how that would happen. But I think my question is more around sort of the safety um, aspect rather than the punishment and di or discipline. And so I'm just wondering if there is any reason why the policy can't spell out uh, specific details around guns and if that if that's something that can be included. Um, personally, I would hope that um, if a, a student brings a gun to school, that they would not be uh, permitted back even after a year. And also uh, if a student were transferring in from another school district or school, uh, a charter school, private school, where they had experienced um, bringing a, a gun to school that they wouldn't be able to matriculate into a Sheltonham school. I, I I might I mean I know there um there might be some legal aspects if they were arrested or and not found guilty or something like that, but I'm just wondering if there's any way to spell out more clearly specifics around guns um in the policy. Thank you. Ms. Rachel, Ms. Rachel Jackson, thank you for your um comment and your question. Would you please just state your name for the record and where you reside in the um, township? Sure, and I realized after I spoke that I didn't say that. So um, That's okay. thank you for the reminder. Lakeisha Rodwell Green, and I reside in Elkins Park. Thank you. I don't know. My, my, my only comment, uh, just from experience, is that generally when you see the accidental incidents it's almost always uh, some form of a knife or a blade um, and very frequently what what i've seen is a student will learn that you know they open their lunchbox or they open their book bag and they see it and they actually go report it and they say i just opened my book bag and i realized that my pocket knife from my camping trip over the weekend is in my bag and uh, those are the situations that you know get handled with the discretion here those are generally not cases that go to an expulsion what about the other comments under uh, because again this is not us that have created Sure. So I'm just I'm in just terms of sp spelling anything out about <laughs> weapons uh, or, or guns, or guns, specifically. guns specifically, um, you can always try. This is one of those topics that is, in my mind, hard to address, hard to think about every possible set of facts that you might deal with, and trying to put that into you know a sentence or two may be hard. But there, there's nothing that prevents the board. Uh, from coming up with more of an absolute statement that if this happens, then, then this. So you, you, usually the superintendent right. is in a good position to assess the facts and to make a recommendation. What about the one around if a student from another district is trying to enroll and has had a previous occurrence so as part of the enrollment process for any student, there are certain affidavits that you have to, the parents, guardians, or those that are enrolling children have to sign off on. One of them is whether you're currently expelled from another school for a variety of offenses. As a public school district, for students who reside in your district who are of school age, you have a legal obligation to educate those students. However, if you have a student that is on 
expulsion for certain offenses, you can maintain that expulsion and place the student in an alternative placement uh, for the duration of that of that expulsion. You don't have to then. So if a student from another school district uh, was expelled for a weapons offense and the family now relocates to Cheltenham and they seek enrollment at Cheltenham, Cheltenham would get the discipline record from the other school district, see that this child is going to is was going to be suspended in the other school district for nine more months. You don't have to go through a process to re-expel that student. Right. That expulsion remains, and you can place the student um, in an alternative setting for the period of expulsion. But you, as a public school district, you don't have the ability to say we're going to turn you away. You don't get an education because we we have to educate everyone that's school age that resides in our district. <clears throat> As a board, do you feel that there needs to be any additional clarity around that scenario or not? Maybe if there's a cross reference to the affidavit that um, Mr. Piazza was referring to, that might be helpful to include. That's just my, my thought. I don't know if there's consensus among the house. And then I see that's not it. So. Clarifying question. Sure. So, what you just described is already in place. It's not just a theoretical possibility. It's it's what we correct. It's what required by law and in place. Correct. So that would be adding language within this policy that cross references that process. Correct. Which I'll find the policy. It's probably policy two hundred on wellness students. That's what I was asking. Yeah, that's my request. Okay. But I have a question. Yeah, Ms. Lowen. So if we say we got a student from, because this applies to kids who are transferring from public or private schools, say we get a kid from you know, either one of those schools who has been expelled for, you know, um, six months from bringing a weapon to school. Can we impose a longer penalty on them? And there's in the school where they committed the offense to. I believe the answer to that question is no. We maintain the suspension or expulsion that is in place. Um, admittedly, I don't know that I've ever addressed that that factual scenario because I think the I think the law states that. Sort of would be double jeopardy, but it says you can assign a student to an alternative assignment for a period not to exceed the period of expulsion, which would be right. whatever decision was made okay. at another school. Okay. Um, Mr. Shaw, did you have something? Go ahead. I was just. It, uh, moving forward, I was asked for the cross reference to oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I do as well. Um, would that be a material change to the policy since there's already language referencing the practice, or is it simply a cross reference? The, the do we need to vote? Do we need to vote on a new version? The, the cross yeah. reference would not be um, a substantive change. Yes. We substantive. may make some substantive changes in the definition section. Okay. Uh, we'll make more affirmative. Uh, references to the CHARC policy uh, to a team. <laughs> Dr. Scriven had suggested some language about, around signaling why there may not be an AR. So what will likely happen is we'll, we'll bring this back next month with uh, some more changes proposed. It'll be a repeat first read. It'll be a repeat first read. It won't even go for first read because it hasn't even gone yet. We'll, I think the goal was to have the discussion here. We'll then make the changes and bring them to the board okay. for consideration in October. Great. Thank you. How many other board questions? Well, I guess we're at the community. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, board. Um, any other questions from the community? I think we have one online. Okay. Um, I can't see who's saying this right. Yep. That was. Miss, um, oh, 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 okay. All right. So then that's it. What about the Q&A? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sure. Anything in the Q&A? That was also Miss Bradwell Green. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Any other board questions? Okay, so this policy will come back to the policy committee in the October meeting as a new revised policy. Correct. And, and what we'll do in the meantime, if it would be helpful, is we'll also look at 356 and 904. Mm -hmm. And if there's recommended changes, we'll bring all three back at one time and can have a discussion about all three. Great. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate both the um, comments from the board and comments from the public. And really appreciate the um, town hall history that engendered bringing this forward as part of the policy convention. Excuse me. Okay. So we have two remaining policies um, to discuss. The next one is policy 109, school library philosophy slash policy. The proposed, uh, proposed title change to school library materials. So policy 109 is here as part of a routine review. You'll note the 2016 last review date. It's one of the older policies. Um, this policy talks about how materials are selected for uh, the library. The changes were not, um, we added um, in the selection criteria for library materials, as we've done with many policies as they come up with review. For those that haven't been reviewed since the board's adoption of the equity policy, we, we build in uh, a statement that the selection of the materials should be consistent with the board's equity statement. You may recall from the, the uh, creation of policy 829, there's quite a bit of language in that policy around instructional materials and making sure that uh, there, is a, there is diversity in a number of ways in the uh, curricular materials that are used. So that change was made. And then there was Um, we clarified the process for uh, challenges to any materials that goes through uh, the assistant superintendent's office. Previously, there was a reference here to a curriculum materials review policy. That was a policy years ago that was repealed. Uh, so we so we tweaked the question materials process and the current practice is that that uh, goes through the assistant superintendent's office. The, the district sharing language uh, was was just not applicable any longer. And this library bill of rights, this was language that was in here previously. However, the American Library Association's philosophy had changed since 2016. So the statement that you're seeing here is the current philosophy of the American Library Association. And the, the statement aligns well with <clears throat> Cheltenham's uh, vision and equity statement and what we believe the board would be looking for in a philosophy around library materials. Um, any, any questions from the board for the final response? Um, first, I just I did want to just recognize and say thank you for the inclusion of the ALA's new uh, Bill of Rights. It's really, really happy to see that it's in there, um, so especially in these days. Um, the the uh, the question that I had really was around the language, the new language added under question materials. Um, in order to sort of have standing to question library materials, do you have to be a resident or a taxpayer of the district, or can it come from anyone? It's interesting that you asked that under the library policy, not at library and each other. Um, you have to be a resident of the township in order to bring a challenge to the library. So there's there is no there is no entitlement 
by um, non-interested stakeholders to just make challenges to school library materials. Um, the, the board could, the, the board could, I mean, anyone always has the right, residents and taxpayers have the right to uh, speak at public comment, and anyone uh, has the right to file right to know requests for records. And certainly anyone is always entitled to email the board. Uh, whether the board responds to those inquiries or not uh, is up to each board director. Uh, but there's, this is not intended to provide a right that doesn't independently exist. The board could consider changing this to parents or guardians or Okay, residents. 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 Of, yeah. that, that still isn't going to stop. Right. But it doesn't entitle them to process. Yeah. Right. Right. Sorry, I'm going to board. And, and all, it, all it <laughs> entitles anyone to is a response from the assistant superintendent. So the response can be thank you. It's been reviewed. <laughs> this textbook is consistent with our, you know mission statement and curriculum, and yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, just thought we might, since uh, staff as well, would mm -hmm. also be included in who could raise a concern. Yeah, right. Right. Oh, is that right? I guess technically. That's why you say, that's why you say right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have two, two, one comment, one question. Um, Cyber Trump's with There are right now, I, I believe there are circumstances where a student might not be able to check out a book. And that might be they already have one book at home who hasn't really turned back in. Um, I just wanted to raise the concept that maybe we consider a policy where students can always check out a book. Um, I know that our public libraries don't have fees anymore for overdue books, we wouldn't have fees, but also it doesn't preclude a child from checking out a book, even if they have an overdue book, because why would we want to turn down a book to a kid? So I just wanted to mention that as a possibility. Um, and then the, so the question is, can we, can we explore that? And then the other is, um, we do have a Cheltenham is it a, a library system within Cheltenham? I wonder if they're, and they, I know that they presented, uh, Mary Kay presented to this the board relatively recently about opportunities for collaboration. And if this might be a, a good policy or AR to start to codify what that collaboration might look like. And also, I'd be very interested if they have stakeholder guidance or advice on things we might not be thinking of as a school system that would be good for current modern best practice in the library. Well, uh, it's directly related. I guess I was wondering, thinking about that presentation and thinking about our amazing public library system, I guess I don't, the dist, under district sharing what we took out and it talks about you know, uh, extensive interlibrary loan, all, you know, in that state. Is that because it just doesn't need to be in the policy or because it exists? So I think the thought here was the language sort of suggested that all materials and all books are shared across schools. My understanding is that the librarians at each level, so a book that's in the high school library may not be appropriate for the Myers library. Right. So it's actually not true that books are just shared. Books may be shared across levels. Um, but one of the things per our policy uh, that that, um, you know, you look to when you when you figure out what's appropriate material is, you know, what's relevant to the curriculum at that level. So I think that's why the language that's why the language came out. If there's different sharing procedures with the township library or something that we should build in we could we could certainly build that language back in 
Oh, well, I guess I just, I was curious why it was taken out. That kind of explains the question. It doesn't mean that that can't happen or Correct. doesn't happen. It's just not quite as fluid as Correct. the policy. But I guess now it's missing completely. And I don't know if it needs to be in there or not. It's fair enough if it doesn't need to be in the policy. I don't know the answer to that, but I just want clarification. From my standpoint, any materials that are uh, purchased by the district, they are district property. And so to the extent that uh, one school is looking for a book and it's appropriate and available at another school, it can go back and forth. I just don't, my understanding was that, that it's not a, um, it's not a routine defined process that, or, or there's not one database where all the books are listed and they just go back and forth. Generally, the library, the books that are in the library are in a school's library and they don't routinely move back and forth between schools. Yeah, this also talked about working with the public library as well. So I was, I mean, I was speaking more to that part of it. As Mr. Schultz just you know, talked about working with the library and then noticing that had been taken out about interlibrary loan between the public And does that libraries. loan program exist back and forth currently? I don't know if it's back in, I don't know if it's only school district borrowing from, I, I don't know how it works. Yeah, no, I think the library does provide some. Yes, that was my understanding okay. from Ms. Moran. Yep. So we'll, we'll confirm that and then maybe that last sentence of that paragraph, maybe we'll retain that district sharing language and it would just be that last sentence. Yeah. Mr. Diaz, I just have, um, well, and this is really probably for the policy committee. In the very beginning of the purpose section, um, even though we have language later on that talks about kind of an inquiry based uh, approach to the library and library resources, it's further down in the policy. For me personally, I'd like to have that part of the purpose section. The the ALA statement? Um, not really. Be, there are some problems with the ALA statement as well. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think in the um, We talk about you know developing global 21st century skills, and that's really based on a library system that has an inquiry-based approach that engenders creativity, problem solving, you know, um, celebrates the diversity of our um, staff and students. So I think that is a purpose statement. It's more important to include earlier on in our policy rather than even though we have language later on that addressing So this second sentence of the purpose, maybe flipping it yes. with and making that the the way that the policy leads off. Right, but add, adding language that really talks about kind of what I just talked about. Yep. The purpose of what the library is really there for. And I Harken back to Mary Kay's um, presentation a couple of months ago during a Cheltenham and Library System season, where she talked about the library system as being mirrors and windows, meaning that our library um, materials really reflect the diversity of our community, meaning that it's a window to who they are, but it reflects who we are to the outside world as well. Um, and I think that concept really was key as a community member in terms of what I told our libraries would be um, school libraries as well. Um, the other concern I had was I, I'm glad the ALA statement was here. My only concern is that it doesn't really specifically address kind of the protected categories under, under the whole law um, by naming them. And I do think it's important from my perspective to name those categories. So, for example, in number one, talks about origin, background, and views of those contributing to their creation of material. Number five, uses similar language. And then number seven also uses similar language. And I think it should actually include the protected categories like race and 
ethnicity and sex and sexual orientation um, specifically. It's just too general to further. But that's my opinion. <laughs> so I wonder if, so this section is a copy and paste from the American Library Association statement. So we could either modify this, but then if we modify it, then it's not the American Library Association statement. It would be a, a, an iteration of Cheltenham's take on that statement. Or we could supplement this to say, in addition to uh, the position statement of the American Library Association, the board also believes and then list the things that are missing. So the ALA statement could be the floor and the board could always add more language to it. I would just have to, if we're gonna modify the language that's the ALA's statement, I just then wouldn't wanna represent that that's the ALA statement because that verbatim is from the ALA's website. The other option would be to um, maybe asterisk those provisions of the ALA statement that are specifically from the ALA and then to the extent that we modify um, paragraphs one, five, and seven that we um, indicate that those are, you know, specific to Shelton. Mr. Shelton? Just uh, um, similar to that, we could, couldn't we just specify up front that what we are writing here is inspired by the ALA, but we don't need, I mean, and that is crediting them, then we can do whatever we want after that. And I guess first I would take it to some consensus whether we want to work those protected categories specifically in the policy law. I'm yeah. just wondering. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I, would, I would be in support of that. I mean, it does, it does, I mean, in fact, align with our position and our equity statement. Mm -hmm. The fact that we discuss those excluded groups mm -hmm. in various fashions and support them in everything. So, you know, I could see um, again as one board member supporting um, any revision to where we can define that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Just a couple more head now. Yeah. So, modify this statement to include the protected classes and somehow note that those specific provisions were modified. So yeah, I heard. Yeah. Any other board questions or comments? Any questions or comments from the community? Any hands raised on Zoom? No, no hands raised. Okay. All right. Yeah. I just want to, I've thrown out that idea about kids being able to have. I wondered, wait, like, is that going to be explored or does that need to be a discussion? So, the, and the, very importantly, what would the administration actually think of that idea? So, I, you wrote it down, you yep. all will discuss and come back. And, and Dr. Thanks. Smith, we may need to, uh, I don't know what the policies are at the individual schools. We may need to talk to the librarian and the building principals. I don't know what the current practices are around when you can check out books and when you can't. So, we'll, we'll get different at all. It's different. <laughs> Thank you. That's so, all. All right. so we'll, we'll get some additional I information. To report that. I didn't know that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll come back to me with language or not. Language. Not, that's not <laughs> at least with information. Right. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Um, last on the agenda is policy in AR 907 visitors to district schools during the school. Yes, so 907, so we had a uh, discussion, let me, let me see when, uh, back in, well, earlier this school year, I think, at the beginning of the school year, we started looking at 907. 907 is old, uh, it's from it's from 2014, it's, it's coming up on uh, almost 10 years here. Uh, nothing has, the board has suggested a number of, of revisions throughout the last time around. All of those changes were made. The one issue that really wasn't resolved was um, the uh, visitor access procedures and um, what happens when 
folks enter our building, what do, what do the procedures look like, particularly around uh, visitors who may not be able to produce identification? And we've had some, I know I've spoken with a few of the administrators in the in the months since we've, we've discussed that. I think the, the thought was, and, and this is just a thought uh, for the board to discuss, was that our, our policy really should set for, hopefully the policy sets for the expectation. So the expectation is that uh, all visitors produce ID. And perhaps we could add language to say, if for some reason, you know, rare and unique circumstances preclude someone from being able to do this, give them a point of contact who will be able to work with them on a case-by-case -case basis to otherwise determine whether they have a legitimate purpose for being in the building and how that should be handled. And that was the administrative recommendation to bring back to the board for discussion. But, but the thought was to keep the general rule that as a general matter, ID is required. And if for some reason you don't or can't do that, this is who you'll need to speak with who will otherwise verify your identity and determine that you have a legitimate reason to be in the building. Any board questions or comments regarding um, policy in our assessment? I know we had extensive conversation the last time you did that around. Well, just as somebody who participated in that conversation, I, I, that sounds um, like it would appease my concerns, and I greatly appreciate that that was discussed. I concur with that. Any other input? Questions or comments? Okay. Any comments or questions from you? I, I, I will make it. A, Humorous comment. Um, the high school last year, I didn't have my identification with me, and I said to the gentleman and Jarvis, who know me, have my identification. Well, I can't let you in. And I, I respected that, and I had to walk back to my car and get it. Um, I thought they did. <laughs> Everyone should know. Right? <laughs> But, uh, my high school picture didn't work at the time. But, <laughs> but it, 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 it's good and it's in place and it's effective. Thank you. Thank you. Here, Knox, so, so I'm not sure this question is really more of a um, if a family has a domestic issue where a protection from abuse order is in place from a parent regarding the child. Um, how do we go to the school so that this parent is not supposed to be coming to the school because it's a child? What is the process for that? That's something I'm not sure of at all. And I don't know if it's broken down in this policy or is that a procedure or is that covered? So the student services office, um, a lot of times that information comes to the district at enrollment, at least in uh, not necessarily like a PFA or something like that, which can come up at any time, uh, but many times at enrollment, if there's um, a custody agreement uh, that will outline uh, the rights of the different parents at different times, those uh, uh, student services uh, implements those uh, custody agreements, communication with the appropriate school officials. Generally, when there are times, and you know, and they they do happen. They're, they're routine where um, courts will impose limitations on uh, one parent or a family member for any number of reasons. It could be a temporary situation. It could be a more permanent situation. Uh, those those agreements, those uh, court orders, are received by the student services office, and they're reviewed. If there's questions about the interpretation of them, they, they routinely come to my office and then they're communicated out to the, to the school levels. It's actually a process that's um, you know, unfortunately fairly routine and has um, not, not just a chill man, right? Just everywhere. Uh, and there are, there are good processes in place to make sure that 
those things are implemented with fidelity. Okay. Thank you. Usually with with something like a PFA, the, the, the parent that is the protected protected from the potential abuse, uh, they are they have every incentive to notify the school and it usually comes to us from, from that parent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, any other questions in the queue? No. No? Okay. I wanted to thank you ladies for attending this evening and uh, for the whole thing. It's not just one time, it's like many times. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Tinazio and Ms. Um, Public Jackson for getting us through yet another series of policies that are not too dated, actually. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to call for a chamber by the motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.